Okay, good evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, welcome, everyone, to our inaugural In Conversation uh, with the Leeds Alum Author Webinar, which has been developed by the Advancement Team with Leeds Alumni Book Club. Just to explain who I am, I'm Phil Steele. I'm Head of Alumni and Support Engagement here at the University of Leeds. And the purpose of these kinds of events is to really bring everybody together, bring our alumni community together um, so we can share stuff we're interested in, um, celebrate the fact that we're alumni and hopefully, you know, to make to make being an, a, an, an alum of the University of Leeds kind of valuable and, and of interest to you. So we're really pleased to welcome you tonight. Um, I have often or at least sometimes been told that I try to cram too much into um, talks and presentations. Um, I've never tried to cram 4.6 billion years into an hour before, but we will see how we go um, tonight. But before we get onto the, the substance of tonight, um, I just want to have a um, just go through a couple of technical points um, before we start. So firstly, uh, the webinar is being recorded. So if anyone needs to leave early, if you need to live early, that's absolutely fine. Um, as a recording will be available online in the, in the coming days. Um, so you'll be able to watch it at, at, your, at your leisure. Um, we will be using the chat function, um, so keep an eye on that. We'll use that to share any relevant links and information as the conversation progresses. So uh, keep your ears piled, keep your eyes piled on the the chat box for that. Um, if you have any questions uh, through the conversation, obviously we'd love to to to, to have them. Um, if you can use the Q and A function um, on Zoom, uh, you'll find that at the bottom of your screen and uh, we'll do as, as best as we can to cover as many of your questions for Henry as possible. Uh, so those are the formalities over with. Um, I'd now like to introduce and welcome our host and interview for this evening, David Adam. David is a best-selling author of The Man Who Couldn't Stop and The Genius Within, and he's in his own right an award-winning journalist who spent two decades at Nature and The Guardian. He is, of course, a, a University of Leeds graduate as well, and so we are delighted to welcome him tonight. Over to you, David. Uh, thank you very much, Phil. Uh, yeah, hello, everyone. I graduated from the University of Leeds in 1993. Um, and then I enjoyed it so much, I went and did it all again. I did a PhD by uh, graduating in 1997. Uh, and it was during that time that I started writing for the lead student newspaper, um, which opened my eyes to, to what I might be able to do in the future. Uh, I've known Henry for a very long time. Uh, I first met Henry in, two, in the year 2000. Um, I feel like I've had about a dozen jobs since then, whereas I think I'm right in saying Henry has had just the one. And, and what a job it is. Um, Henry will introduce himself, but just to say, as far as I was concerned, my view of Henry's job was he just got to kind of assess. If you were a scientist and you found an interesting fossil and you thought it was going to say something interesting about human evolution and you wanted to reach as many people as possible by publishing in nature which is the best scientific journal in the world you had to get past this man you had to convince him that you were right and that uh, the discovery was important and if it was then henry would would stamp it with his green light and uh, away we would go um henry i see you've joined um welcome uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself and and your time at leeds um did you ever work for the student newspaper no, I I didn't. My uh, coming to student life was uh, quite quite uh, student journalism was quite late after I'd left Leeds. Actually, uh, I uh, graduated from Leeds in 1984, and um, I wanted to stay at Leeds and do a PhD, but I didn't. I went to Cambridge, and that's when I started being more interested in in doing doing writing for various. Um, yeah, we in Cambridge there's nothing as mighty as lead student. It's much more fissile and divided up. There's the college rag, and for a while I ran the graduate, uh, the graduate unions rag, which was very tiny, and I wrote the whole thing, including compiling the crossword. So it was all very uh, small beer. Um, so, uh, so, so, so yes, yeah. Excellent. Well, um, I think we're all in for a treat this evening. Henry uh, is one of those marvelous people who has a story about everything. Uh, so I'm very much hoping that he will make my job 
very easy. If there are any awkward silences, it's almost certainly because Henry has accidentally muted himself rather than he's run out of anything interesting to say. Um, so, Henry, here's the book. I have it. Uh, That's it. I recognise it. I do recommend it. Um, it's called A Very Short History of Life on Earth. Uh, why don't you just give us a very short history of, of Henry G's sort of take on, on, on his job th that he does at the moment, and then a bit about how that segued into the book. Um, I fell into nature by a series of unlikely events. I was finishing my PhD at the University of Cambridge and decided I didn't have the kind of um, monomania or concentration span that you needed to become a research scientist. And I was too busy writing and I was too busy interested in other things. Um, then my PhD advisor put an advert on my desk for an assistant editor at Nature. This is one of the people who do, as you described so eloquently earlier, um, uh, is a gatekeeper. They assess the science that it comes in and decide whether in principle it might be suitable for nature. So I applied for that job and didn't get it. Um, but I was coming to the end of my funding and I hadn't heard from the uh, from nature. I um, I went up for an interview uh, and me and the interviewer interviewers uh, regarded each other with frank mutual incomprehension. Uh, and much to my surprise, I was invited to a second interview with the late, great John Maddox, who was the uh, who was a, the mercurial, infuriating and brilliant editor of nature for a long time. And we kind of hit it off. But I didn't hear again, and I was running out of money and wondering what to do. And it turned out that on the 11th of December uh, 1987, at 10.30 in the morning, um, you see, I remember these things well, you know, where were you when Kennedy was shot? Where were you when you heard Princess Diana had died? That sort of thing. Where was I uh, when I heard I got a job of nature? It was in the basement of the Zoology Museum in Cambridge. The phone went ring, ring, and it was passed to me by the uh, by a colleague and said, it's for you. It's the editor of nature. So I go, oh, yes, I've really arrived. And remember, this was just before Christmas. And uh, uh, Maddox said, um, I'm offering you a job as a writer, as a news writer. Um, this is Friday at 10.30 in the morning. I said, great, when, I, when do I start thinking, you know, after Christmas? He said, oh, Monday at half past nine. Um, so very quickly, I went to join Nature and I was a news reporter to start with, a bit like you were for most of the time. And I soon learned to become ridiculously authoritative about things I knew nothing about in, in almost no time at all. So I was given a news story to write about radiological protection guidelines, which I knew from nothing because I'd been a paleontologist three days before. And um, I said, OK, uh, they said, we want 300 words. I said, great, when? And they said lunchtime. And so that began my glittering career. And in in course of time, I did actually get the kind of job that I applied for and initially failed, which was to be part of the prestigious back half where I assessed the uh science um that was coming into nature um so that was uh, and i've been doing that for 35 years i've been doing one or two other things as well but that's basically it i didn't i never knew you were a news reporter to start with so in fact you've evolved yes i keep it dark i don't tell anyone you've evolved into your existing job in a way uh, yes um i did a lot of other things at nature i am um, one of the one of the jobs i really enjoyed and i still have nightmares sorry dreams about is I used to compile nature's weekly press release uh, each week. And so I had to write authoritatively about an enormous range of subjects in language that uh, people could understand. And I also, you know, got um, uh, practice in writing lurid headlines that uh, that um, people people could, uh, people would, um, dyspeptic journalists, it would rouse them from their torpor in time for a press deadline. All, uh, all hmm. good headlines are lurid. Um, well, my favourite one, which actually I didn't get to use, um, uh, was all about a picture that nature was given. Um, I used to sit on the uh, weekly meeting that decided what would go on the cover of nature. And we had we were submitted this picture. It was of two octopuses in the deep sea. It was um, when this Alvin submersible went down to the deep sea, it went down and down and down till it's completely dark. And then its motion sensors would detect something moving. And then it would switch on these incredibly bright lights and see what it was and take pictures of it. So 
lit harshly with this gothic light were two octopi, different species, unknown to science, both male and having sex. And we were wondering whether to put that on the cover. And um, one of my colleagues said, no, we can't put that on the cover. It's absolutely disgusting. But I could already write the headline, um, Bestial Sodomy in the Abyss. Um, uh, luckily, it didn't make the cover. And I yeah, used something well, less lurid. Uh, well, that was my favourite one. Your loss to headline writing became, of course, the gain of, uh, as I described, your kind of, well, as you described it, the gatekeeper of, of I'm going to say fossils, but more than fossils, perhaps? I do all sorts of things these days. I was a paleontologist. Now I describe myself as a recovering paleontologist. Uh, and um, uh, fossils, the relics of uh, creatures that lived a long time ago, uh, that is about um, half of what I do now. I, I cover a lot of... Um, uh, a, a wide range of subjects. As I've been at Nature for a very long time, I managed to extend my pseudopodial reach into many different uh, um, pots. I, I've, I've got to stop using these metaphors. I'll get into an awful knot. I've, I do a lot of covering of work for other people uh, now, and I help a lot of other people out. So it, I can be doing you know, hardcore molecular biology one day and you know geophysics or animal behavior um uh, all in the course of one day and i have to say it um the intellectual interest of my job is just marvelous because on every, any given day i can learn several things i'd never known before i get to know really new things and it certainly um keeps me off the street well, it sounds like there's at least another six books in in your job. But let's let's talk about this one. Um, I think that's why people have have signed up. Um, let's start at the beginning. Uh, well, not the very beginning because that's in the book. But uh, let's start at the beginning of this book project. How did it come about? Well, you will know this too because I had just finished another book. I mean, you know what it's like when you read a book. I um, uh, well, when you write a book, I uh, heard um. And in another course of my life, I studied English A-level at night school because I'd never done it. And the, we were studying Virginia Woolf. And the um, uh, the teacher said, Virginia Woolf was a depressive. She used to start very cheerful when she started a book. But the further and further she got, uh, she got more and more depressed. And I said to myself, you don't have to be Virginia Woolf or depressive to feel like that about books. And whenever I get to another book, end of a book, I swear I'm not going to write another book. So I just finished a book and I came up to into I came up to disturb you when you were writing a leader at nature and to talk about our book projects and I said I'm not going to write another book and you um, cheerfully ignored me and said why don't you Henry that's what you call me because it's my name why don't you Henry talk about uh, write a book about all these wonderful fossils that I've had the privilege of seeing at first hand, the papers thereof pass across my desk, desk at Nature in all the millions of years that I've been working at Nature. So still protesting that I wasn't going to write the book, I went and wrote the book, but it wasn't quite the same book. It turned, uh, it was more of a kind of uh, memoir um, uh, with lots of jokes. Uh, and um, I showed this to my parents who are very stern critics and they said it's very nice dear but who apart from all the people you mention all these paleontologists is going to read it and um who's going to care so my agent was a deal more tactful so we basically recast it and recast it i mean you know what it's like with books they you know you they they take several goes to get right we recast it as the narrative that you see before you now i'm very fond of a something that neil gaiman said about writing books he said in the first draft you just write anything that anything that comes into your head you just uh, slap it down on the page it's only in the second draft that you try to make it look like you knew what you were doing all along uh, and so there was a certain amount of that in the second draft but i have to say it came out very easily in the end i wasn't sweating and straining in my garret trying to um wrest each tortured sentence out of my fevered brain in the end it all it all felt very easy and i haven't enjoyed a book of the well writing it 
as much as this whether you've enjoyed reading it is another question which we may draw a veil over that but um I, i've certainly uh it was a very easy book to write well i can tell you actually as you've been speaking we have asked our audience um and 29% uh, of people watching have read it. Hooray! And a further 14% are currently reading it. Mm. So if you guys could just put the book down for a moment, uh, we'll continue the conversation. And, and I would say, please do. Henry, we had a run through before, and Henry said he really uh, enjoys the sort of uh, back and forth with an audience. Now, it's difficult to get that on Zoom sometimes. But do please, he's very willing to, uh, to answer any of your questions, uh, as well as some of the questions that I have here. Um, so do please uh, write those in the Q&A. And we have people behind the scenes uh, handling those who will bring them to our attention. Um, the book, it really does what it says on the cover. Uh, it, it really does uh, describe um, uh, the origins and the evolution of life and the history of life throughout the pretty much the whole time of the planet, um, obviously before there was life and then the origins of life and then how life has, has emerged. Um, it has, a, one of the things that I noticed when I read it, it has so many different Latin names of species. Um, and I, Henry doesn't know I was going to ask him this and he can say no. But Henry, would you say that you can describe every species in this book from the Latin name? Uh, not from the Latin name, but I, 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 they're all my friends, so I, I kind of know what they look like. Um, one of the criticisms that has been levelled at this book is there are no pictures. So people have said, um, I've looked at all, I have to look up all the Latin names on Google or well, I was other, other search engines are available while I was uh, reading this. And why haven't we got any illustrations? I took a conscious decision not to have illustrations partly because there are lots and lots and lots of books about the history of life which have got wonderful pictures in the second is that of extinct creatures the um illustrations will tell you what some artist thinks they look like rather than what they actually look like which we cannot know um and also i wanted to make it read like a novel i wanted to make it like a, a novel or a bedtime story for grown-ups it even starts once upon a time so that you ought to just be able to go with the flow and some of the times i when i was describing some of the creatures um uh, i would do little pen portraits of what they look like some of them were rather whimsical um and um to get a feel of what this not just looked like but how it how it was how it behaved um it's it's kind of attitude so my favorite uh, uh creature was a creature from the triassic period um uh 210 225 something like that millions of years ago called lystrosaurus and i wrote that it had the body of a pig the attitude to food of a golden retriever and the head of an electric can opener which i think pretty much sums it up enough to give you an idea of its cheerful go anywhere eat anything attitude which is why it was the top creature in the early triassic period for example and so did you say you sketch these as as illustrations or just no, sort of no well i did them as pen portraits i didn't actually draw I anything I'm a, ho I'm a hopeless draw drawerist i was going to say that would make a very interesting uh, sequel i think and uh, interpretation well there's going to be an illustrated version for kids, which I've done all the text for. Um, uh, now I'm waiting for the artist who's, uh, I, I don't think I can say too much, but the artist is doing her, doing her thing at the moment. I mean, the art takes a lot longer. Um, it's a completely new text uh, I've had to do. Um, uh, but uh, we will have in interpretations of some of these creatures coming up, and I haven't seen them yet either. I've only seen a few test test prints, but um, so there is an illustrated version coming up, probably the end of next year, I should think. I think I think you fell for my powers of journalism there and revealed a scoop, didn't you? Um, well, I've been seeding it very very carefully, but um, <laughs> to, to various people, but I don't think anyone's really taken any notice. OK, now let's let's talk a bit about the contents of the book, or I suppose how you have seen the study of fossils change, um, because you have been at nature for 30, 35, 35 years, 35 years. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm guessing that no one else would have me, David. <laughs> I'm uh, that you know, that's not true. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm no, I, I know it is true. <laughs> I'm guessing that in the in the earlier days, then I won't say the older days, the earlier days, that um, people would dig up a fossil 
and then you would kind of have to queue to see it you know you might take pictures but it'd be quite difficult to, to get a look at it um is, is that still the same or have things like 3d printing now changed the way that we view fossils and and also fossils well why don't you just talk a bit about what fossils are how they're formed and crucially how we're now finding different types of fossils gosh there's such a lot to unpack but um fossils are the remains of creatures, animals, plants, any other living things that have somehow survived, preserved, usually flattened in rock uh, until the present time. They're mostly bones and teeth. And as they are buried in the rock, the mineral content of the bones and teeth is replaced by minerals in the rock. Um, and so that's why most fossils that you will find, and I'm sure many people in the audience have found fossils, they're usually shells, uh, hard parts, teeth occasionally, um, and bones. Very, very rarely do you find fossils of the softer parts of, of creatures, things like feathers, skin, internal organs, um, even in some cases, nerves and brains. Um, so uh, it, it, in the past couple of decades there's been a lot of technological development now as you started with your your question that was always a problem uh people would write in with a fossil and um there was only one of it you couldn't you know reproduce it and it was sometimes very difficult to go and see we would always insist at nature and still do that a fossil is um that is described in nature is part of a you know a stably curated collection and not somebody's private stash and um uh, and people could go and see it but now of course there are all sorts of imaging techniques with x-rays and other kinds of imaging and 3d printing and uh people can upload their data online and make a, a copy in sometimes very very high resolution in all sizes of a, of a fossil um but one thing i found as an editor was of course i don't see the fossils i just see the pictures um and i just have an idea of you know what they look like in terms of a photograph and um, i it's always wonderful for me if i get the chance to see a fossil for myself now this happened uh, i remember a particular occasion we started getting fossils from northeastern china of dinosaurs birds with feathers and beaks and internal organs preserved beautifully in the sediments in a volcanic lake um uh, that covered most of northeastern china about 120 million years ago and these all came from China and it astonished the world. And uh, Nature published the first few of these um, under my watch. But I always wanted to see them. And I hadn't gone to China at that time. I've since been a couple of times. Um, but then there was a, an exhibition came to the Natural History Museum in London called Feathered Dinosaurs from China. And so I popped the two-year-old with a child minder. It was half term. I took the four-year-old with me. Um, on the tube and off we went to look now as you know if you know the natural history museum in london the main dinosaur exhibition is absolutely rammed with people at all times but this feathered dinosaurs in china exhibition was in a little room all on its own um by the you know in a little gallery and you had to pay extra to get in so that really cut down on the number of people so me and the four-year-old paid and went in and there were nine fossils all beautifully lit like works of art and uh, I remembered one of them that had been the subject of a paper in Nature that had a very difficult time getting through the peer review process and the publishing process. And it was much bigger than I thought. It was laid out on a great big slab. So there was I beard stroking and there were about three other people looking at fossils in you know, mute contemplation, except my four year old that was whizzing around like a stray asteroid. So I was looking at this fossil completely lost in contemplation, had completely forgotten about the child until a little head popped up on the other side of the table and said, Dad, did you punish this in nature? Uh, <laughs> and so I said, yes, uh, yeah, I, they sent it to us and we punished it. And then we had a went to the cafe and I had a very nice, nice glass of wine. And that's all I remember of that day. Um, uh, but things have changed and, you know, the fossils do come to you. You know, you can. It's a lot easier to get the data, to handle the data, to recreate fossils now. And there are many, many ways. A lot of the fossils we look like haven't even been developed out of the rock. They've been photographed. They've been done 
you know, by X-rays or CT scans um, and uh, without even damaging it by taking it out of the piece of rock, which is wow. usually what needs to be done. And that's that's just amazing. So no, if you went to look I, at I, it in the museum, you wouldn't see anything. You just have to see the pictures of all there are. I, I mentioned 3D printing. Have I made that up or did I hear or read that somewhere that, that you can 3D print fossils? Oh, yeah, yeah, you can do that now. Yeah, yes, you can do that. Um, and uh, one of the most famous fossils is a the partial skeleton of an early human relative, uh, Ardipithecus, no, Australopithecus afarensis, known as Lucy, um, who's curated in Ethiopia. And um, Lucy has been 3D printed. And I think if you if you ask someone nicely, they'll send you the send you all the detail you need to make bits of it to use in your teaching collection or whatever. So wow. so no, this is quite commonplace now. OK, um, yeah. so we have had a question come in and I am going to ask you, but I've just thought of a question that people might be interested in when we're talking about people sending in um, fossil or pictures of fossils or claims for fossils. You know, there have been some very high profile examples in the past of people creating fossils, you know, putting two together and, and pretending and basically hoaxing people that they found uh, a fossil that never actually existed. Uh, uh, do you ever get any of those? Yes, we have had quite a few of those in the past. Well, we, uh, that's not just the royal we. I mean, there are more and more in nature than me, so it is we. No, we have had a few that have come uh, along, and particularly in, in China, where a lot of the fossils are discovered by uh, farmers and people working in the field and sell them to dealers. There's a certain amount of cut and shut jobs that have to be um, uh, uh, eliminated uh, we don't get that as much as we used to but it certainly does go on uh and um and people have you ever have got close stunned. to ever got close to taking one seriously oh yes i won't tell you which <laughs> you didn't publish it though um well um there was one that we did publish but it was a, a different thing because they realized halfway through that they'd been spoofed um and when they took out took off the bits that were well there was and there was another one that was um, actually two different creatures but two uh, you know the back half of one and the front half of another that had been glued together but each one was interesting so i think they all ended up in in nature somehow or they were certainly published but when they got rid of the rude parts um so we have as i said please do send in questions we have one from from april maston who i think is in long island new york hello april thank you um it's a really beautifully phrased question. I, I'm, I'm not even going to try and paraphrase it. I'm just going to read it out, Henry, if you'll bear with me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I think this is one of the, uh, what did we say, 29% of people who have read the book? Or maybe April's one of the 14% who are reading it and has got... No, I think she's read it because she end. gets to the Can end. Yes. see the question? Yes. Can everyone else see the question or shall I read it out? Uh, I'll, I'll read it. One of the most intriguing aspects of this history for me was finding out about the several extinctions that occurred after great catastrophic events. This may seem odd, but learning that life returned after those extinctions made me feel less afraid of the extinctions of Homo sapiens. But the end of the book, which describes the end of the Earth in a million years or so, did upset me. You say that knowing that makes what we do now more, not less important. Can you explain what do you mean? I shall try, April, and thank you for that question. Um, the subtitle of this book is 4.6 billion years of history, but actually I add another billion years on for free. Um, you know, you don't have to pay any more for this. So it's actually 5.6 billion because, um, spoiler alert, life on Earth will come to an end long before the planet is swallowed up by the sun when it gets to a red giant phase. In about a billion years' time, the Earth will um, will will no longer be able to support life, and all life will die off. Um, but also, given that um, life has existed for such a long time, at least four four billion years, and will go on for another billion years more, the uh, tenure of human beings on the Earth is is as of a mayfly; it is fleeting. Most mammalian species last for a million years or so. Human beings in some form or another is, as Homo sapiens, very broadly constituted, have been around for about 300,000 years. Um, and so we're almost halfway through an average day. We may we may wink out next week or we may go on for tens of millions of years. It's just an average. But we won't go on forever, uh, at least 
um you know if we were like most other species the the, the uh, and all species will die eventually but i strangely i got a kind of hope from that i was trying to work out how to end the book and i was trying to think of how how given this rather bleak prospect um what message we might take from that and um i thought of a science fiction writer um what you can't see behind me because i blurred it is my immense collection of science fiction um there was a science fiction writer called olaf stapledon who was active in the um in the 30s and he wrote this fabulous book called star maker in which he um discusses the entire history of the cosmos and the history of human beings is you know tiny and um uh, he says in this book and i i'm i won't go and try and find it because i won't be able to find it he said what can we take from this immensity um what what significance does do does the fleeting life of these tiny animals us have against the immensity of the cosmos and he said somehow that makes it more rather than less important for us as thinking beings to appreciate our place in the cosmos and somehow do our best to strive for the light before the ultimate darkness now a bit of context stapleton was a pacifist and although he was a pacifist he had served in the first world war on the western front as an ambulance driver for, for the society of friends and he uh, wrote the book in 1937, 1938, just as another war was happening. So he was trying to say, what comfort can we take from our fleeting existence? Um, I, I think if you were put into modern terms, I think somehow it makes us, it makes it more rather than less important to basically leave the place in as good a condition as we found it. Will the last human being please turn off the lights? So it's uh, an aesthetic reason, not as human beings, to trash the place, but to try and do our best to serve other people and the other life forms on the planet before we finally snuff out. In other words, to do our best with what we can. Uh, so in a strange way, I found it a rather terrifying vision, but also somehow comforting. Uh, it's very hard to explain. I would recommend that you go and read Star Maker by Olaf Stapledon, although I have to say it's not for everyone. It's a very strange book, although it's one of my favourites. Yeah, thank you, Henry. Uh, and I should say for anyone who was alarmed by April's um, suggestion at the end of the Earth is going to come in a million years, as Henry pointed out, it's going to happen in a billion years, which I think we can all find very real. Yeah, few. You, you know, Christmas won't be cancelled. Uh, not <laughs> uh, this year while while we're on the sort of the, the very big issues of the cosmos and life and and life ending do you have a view on on life elsewhere in the universe and if so would it would it have evolved in in the same way or or could it have evolved in a very different way it's a very exciting time to ask that because when i joined nature nobody knew of any other planets outside the solar system uh, now there are at least 5,000. Now, this is not a cause and effect uh, caused by me coming to nature. I, I think the planets would have been found anyway. So people have been asking a lot about life in the universe. My own view is that life uh, in its simplest form will be very, very common. I think that any planet, even remotely like the Earth, will have life. I can say this because life evolved almost indecently quickly after the Earth formed, even when the Earth was, you know, pretty hot and steamy and volcanic. Life had already begun. Um, now, the Earth was still being bombarded by enormous planets the size of Mars and, you know, 4.4 uh, uh, billion years ago <clears throat> and was still really quite a knockabout place. 4.1 billion years ago however there is a tiny crystal of a mineral called the zircon um that was once in a rock a sedimentary rock a rock laid down under water in a, you know with life 
all that rock has been worn away, leaving just this zircon. And inside this microscopic zircon is a tiny, tiny bubble in which there is a smut of carbon graphite, the chemical complexion of which suggests that life once passed that way. So it's kind of a recollection of a half-remembered dream of life. But that was 4.1 billion years ago. And I think that shows that life will form. It will form. It just will do that. It's just part of the order of creation that if life gets a chance to form, it will. So I think there are a lot of planets where there'll be life of some form. Now, if they're intelligent life and come up to you and say, live long and prosper, I think that's much, much, much less likely. And even if it were, they wouldn't necessarily look like Klingons or um, or anything we recognize. Um, so I think that um, the uh, the likelihood of any other intelligent life in the universe is unbelievably remote, which, of course, makes preserving what we have all the more important. My son actually has a different perspective. He says there's no intelligent life on Earth at all. He is only there until the lizard people come back and claim him for their own. <laughs> and who's to say he's wrong? Well, he, probably, says, probably, he says a lot of things. They're probably busy um, making pyramids somewhere or, or beaming up um, rural farmers from Arkansas. Yeah, that's right. And um, sticking probes in their orifices. Um, so just very briefly, how long, assuming we don't wipe ourselves out through nuclear war or climate change, how long until the sun swells and wipes out the human race? Well, the human race is another question. Um, life itself will perish around a billion years from now, somewhere between 800 million and 1.5 billion. So about a billion okay. years. And if we were to if we were to hang around that long. Would we evolve? Are we still evolving? Oh, a... yes, we are still evolving. We we, we are constantly evolving. Um, uh, there's lots of um, evidence to show that we've evolved a lot in the past 10,000 years, largely to do with things such as agriculture, exposure to various diseases, um, uh, and, uh, and things like that. Um, so there is a great deal of that. Now, what would we evolve into? I mean, the 1950s picture was of stick thin people with enormous heads. Um, but but who knows? Um, this will be almost another scoop for you. I've just written a book about the future, likely future of humans. Um, uh, I think that it is likely that we will be extinct within 10,000 years for a number of reasons, which I mean, I'm a paleontologist. For me, that's a very, very short amount of time uh, um, uh, for all sorts of all sorts of reasons to do with resources and climate change and various biological uh, factors that have come into play to do with overcrowding and um, uh, and other things. Uh, it's not a very fun read, but my uh, I've got to try and think of a Hollywood ending that my agent would like me to do. But um, uh, when I wrote a very short history of life on earth it occurred to me i was a bit vague about when humans would exist i put in some thousands of years or in about ten thousand years or you know sometime in the future but i wasn't sure but then i i felt i ought to think about this a bit more and uh i did some thinking and reading and reading and thinking and came to the conclusion that the outlook even without nuclear war or being wiped out by artificial intelligence or anything our prospects at the moment don't look good um, for the long term they might look good if we went into space but then we'd probably evolve into all sorts of different creatures and then we the definition of human becomes moot um but that's your scoop i've you know that's gonna yeah i've got to deliver that to the publisher before christmas that definitely sounds more like the virginia wolf model of writing a book um and that was the virginia wolf all the way through that was yeah, depressing if, all the if, way if anyone watching doesn't understand that reference you'll have to watch the beginning on catch up <laughs> um so we had a question before we began um and and i thought it was a really interesting one um and it was about but in particular about human lifespan and how we've extended it over the years and and how we are now living longer than we were perhaps ever evolved to do so or the conditions through which we evolved um and the question was whether have we have we did our ancient ancestors experience things like the menopause for example 
was it all just, just compressed into a different to times uh what sort of lifespan or have we now and you constantly hear the reasons for all the various sort of modern malaises is that the modern world is different to the one that we evolved in um, you know that's blamed for things like mental health it's blamed for dietary problems it's blamed for allergies it, it, but it, is there any sort of truth in 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 that what's your what's your take on those i know there's a lot to go out there maybe start mm -hmm. with the menopause and, and then we can go elsewhere um i think uh the short answer is yes i think the the modern life we have is the cause of a great deal of problems um but our problems go back a long way um one of the terms i use in the book is hominin which is a technical term it basically means any creature more closely related to us than to chimpanzees so it's all the um it's all our precursors and cousins and ancestors and uh back into the past and the mark of a hominin as opposed to any other ape is that it walks upright um now that doesn't sound like much but that and that required the complete re-engineering of the body because and 500 million years ago the backbone evolved as a horizontal structure in a fish that was held in tension but then what did we do we we we, we turned the backbone into a vertical structure held in compression um and that caused all kinds of problems um and it 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 it, engine, it, it meant a complete re-engineering of the whole body from top to toe when you say all kind of problems, do you mean that we had backache? Yes, um, backache, pregnancy problems, um, problems with varicose veins, you know, piles, um, headaches, all kinds of spinal and muscular injuries, and all to do with walking upright. Now, nobody really knows why we walked upright. I mean, there are all kinds of ideas. But that was the first thing that impacted our health. Um, the, but the the biggest thing that impacted our health was the development of agriculture. Now, until uh, 10,000 years ago, all humans lived by hunting and gathering wild foods. Um, and uh, about 10,000 years ago, for reasons no one quite understands, agriculture, a more settled life, developed independently in many different parts of the world. Most people think about the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East, but it happened independently in places as far flung as the southeastern United States to New Guinea. Um, so people had a settled life and they started to eat a more restricted range of, of high calorific but not very nutritious cereal crops um, and much less meat and much less greens. Um, and uh, the uh, advent of agriculture coincided with the advent of a number of things such as tooth decay and also infectious diseases. Now, hunter-gatherers have all sorts of infectious diseases, but when we had agriculture, we started to get diseases from our animals, uh, flu, tuberculosis, all kinds of things like that. So infectious disease. So the human lifespan uh, you know, some of our ancestors would have lived into their late 20s and we managed to live until we were about 40 and it was about 40 for a long time until a kind of demographic transition happened. Now, that's the average lifespan. People could li live to be very, very old, but what I meant was the average was brought down by people having a lot of children and most of those children dying in infancy. Now, thanks to modern medicine, People generally don't die so much of infectious diseases. Now, this has happened in unbelievably recent history. I mean, I'm a you know, spring chicken. I'm you know only 61. But when I was a child, people, uh, children were wiped out by diphtheria and measles and whooping cough. Um, and uh, there was no such thing as the MMR vaccine or, or there was a tuberculosis vaccine. I remember getting measles twice and being in an isolation hospital, uh, you know, with pneumonia. Now, it's only uh, because people rather foolishly don't get their children vaccinated uh, that people don't die of measles when they're children anymore. And that's very recent. Um, but there used to be all these diseases that people used to get all the time, smallpox and, you know, tuberculosis and things like that now people generally don't die of infectious diseases they die of accidents or otherwise ex 
well, I'm talking about children, extremely rare genetic disorders that they that would have been there, but they would have died of something else first uh, back in the past. And as people have got older, they don't die of infectious diseases or you know industrial accidents or just because they're worn out from manual labor. They die of um, heart disease and strokes and um, uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, so uh, the way that human beings live and grow up and die has changed immensely, not just in the past 10,000 years, but in the past 200 years. Um, a lot of uh, problems, I think, are caused because people live very closely oppressed to each other in cities. Now, um, cities are a very, very new invention in terms of human evolution. Uh, they're less than 10,000 years old. Um, and... Um, of course, we haven't kind of adapted to that. And I think that um, living in cities causes a great deal of problems ranging from depression to low sperm count um, and um, and so on. So, yes, there are changes. And I've forgotten what was the rest of your question, David. It was uh, uh, just the, oh, the menopause, the menopause. Yeah. The, the menopause is absolutely fascinating. In the book, I say that only human beings get the menopause that's actually wrong since then i found that only human beings and some species of toothed whale like killer whales have the menopause and what the menopause means is that a reproductive female will stop reproducing halfway through her life and yet live longer now that doesn't make any sense um on the face of it because what living organisms do is grow up as quickly as possible have sex a lot produce lots of offspring and then die what organisms don't do is grow up have sex a lot stop having sex go on living for a much longer period and then die so um what that does is what um, um the menopause does for a woman paradoxically is allow her to leave more descendants than had she kept reproducing in competition for the same resources with her own daughters who were also having children so it makes sense for a woman or a an animal with a longer life to stop reproducing and help her daughters raise her grandchildren ultimately she will leave more descendants that way and when that happened, when human beings first evolved, they invented a whole new cadre of society called the elders, grandmothers. But also, you know, there was a battle of the sexes. Um, the the uh, what affected females had to affect males as well. So um, uh, so men got older as well, only not quite as much. So that uh, females tend to live longer than males in all societies that we 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 know about. Um, but that allowed a whole cadre of, of people who were then the repositories of knowledge. Now, I've read all kinds of um, stories about people in gathered societies. And um, you said, whoops. Oh, you froze, but you're back. Um, we... we uh, I've read all sorts of accounts of people going to see hunter-gatherer societies and the indigenous people take the visitor to a tent or a hut where they meet some unbelievably old person who can hardly stand up and this person the grandmother or the grandfather is the repository of all the knowledge of that group of people and while the uh, uh younger people are busily having children and hunting and gathering the older people will teach the younger people because as children as as along with the menopause and along with people getting older another innovation that humans had is childhood which is a very an extended period of growing up during which the brain matures very slowly so as humans evolved they evolved childhood and they evolved grandmothers and the menopause all kind of at the same time um and uh people are only beginning to um understand that the same is true in several species of whale they have elders who are usually matriarchs who keep the the young bucks in order and stop them you know going around getting into trouble excellent well i i wouldn't be so cautious to say there are benefits to the menopause because there are people on the chat who are pointing out that it uh, really is not fascinating from an individual woman's point of view um we have about 10 minutes henry um we have a couple of questions that have come in there is a similar theme, so I think you can see them as well. I'm just going to read them out together, uh, and then maybe you could address them them together. I think they naturally flow. 
Um, the first one uh, is just someone asking for the receipts. Can you share how you reach projections, for example, that humans will exist until X and other life forms will continue until Y? And then um, assuming that we do know uh, that we're going to be dying out in about 10,000 years, do you have any hope that we would have managed to export ourselves? What a wonderful way of putting it, export ourselves to other worlds. Um, oh, and we have another question about, you write a book about life on Earth, Henry. Everyone wants to talk about the end of life on Earth. Um, we have Olive Walker saying uh, that they believe it's too late for nature to evolve and adapt fast enough to survive to issues of um, to the problems caused by things like global warming and pollution. Why don't we deal with the uh, the end of life in 10,000 years uh, first, and then maybe we can go back to uh, perhaps the sooner. Um, the, the end of life in 10,000 years, it comes from a rather boring statistical calculation, um, which I won't go into now, about the likelihood that the time that you are living in now is in any way special. Like, what is the likelihood that you're living in the first 2.5% of human existence or the last 2.5% of human existence? The likelihood is you're living somewhere in the middle. Um, but that is predicated on the fact or the supposition that the time you are living in is is in some way not special. In my next book, I say that the time we are living in is special because for the first time in human history, the population of humans is slowing down, the growth in the population, and will start to reverse. Uh, so the calculation from that suggests about, about 8,000 to 10,000 years. But it's, a, it's kind of a philosophical point rather than a projection of any current trend. Yes, because projection of current trends is extremely difficult and, and nobody's really projected human populations beyond the year 2300 and those are very, very rough. Um, but it could be that the special time we're living in is right at the beginning of human evolution, in which case we will be going on for 12 million years or so. And I suspect, um, looking at, um, uh, oh, the question about exporting to other worlds, I'm trying to see who asked that. Um, Mandy. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Um, Mandy. I think that that's a very good question. I think that uh, my personal view is that human survival will uh, depend on exporting ourselves to other worlds, either man-made habitats in space or to the moon or to Mars, um, probably inside hollowed out asteroids. Um, uh, now, an interesting fact is that we've um, only, that there have been about 400 people who've gone into space, but then almost all of them have gone into low Earth orbit. Now, the only people who've been, who set foot on the moon, there were only 12 of them, they were all white, male and American, and they all came home again. And that was 50 years ago. The last one was in 1972. In fact, the whole Apollo space program took place in the time it took Led Zeppelin to release their first four albums. And nobody's been back since. But since then, we've had a lot of eccentric billionaires and other people um, projecting and some way and sometimes um fulfilling ideas to make spacecraft that are very powerful and possibly allow us to reach other worlds. It used to be the case that only governments and collaborations of governments could afford to indulge in space travel. That is no longer the case. Of course, only extremely rich people can indulge in space travel, but 100 years ago that was the case for air travel. Um, as well. So it's likely that within a century or two, people will be living in other worlds. Um, but there's a catch. I think if we don't do it within a century or two, we never will, because it requires a large population of people, a large pool of people, um, before you get the people with the knowledge, the education, the technical mouse and the support systems to be able to do rocket science as opposed to chipping flints together. Uh, so uh, that is kind of the answer. And is it too late for nature to evolve fast enough? Well, it already is. You see, one could say, save the planet. But the thing is, the planet will save itself, whether we're on it or not. It's uh, There have been events in the past that I describe in the history of life on Earth that have almost wiped life out several times. And yet life always comes back even more resilient, 
complicated and exciting after each time. Now, uh, what human beings are doing to the earth now um, is not the next, is not a mass extinction. We'd have to keep doing what we're doing for another 500 years for it to even figure amongst the big mass extinctions of prehistory. Um, there are signs that it is reversing. And in fact, by it's rather a shock that by some measure, some measures, biodiversity has actually increased recently. Um, species are decreasing, but the amount of living matter, because human beings move it around the place, has actually increased in some matter. So it, it's not as variety, not doesn't quite have the variety, but there is still quite a lot of it around. So um, we are doing a lot to make life very difficult for a lot of other species. But I think for life in general, the prospect is quite good you know after we after we're gone and evolution will keep going on and evolve all sorts of strange and interesting new forms there you go we did it we beat virginia Woolf. we ended mm. on a happy note mm. um and on that note um i'd just like to thank henry i'd like to thank everybody who's asked questions uh i've learned a lot i learned a lot from the book i always learn a lot from talking to henry and listening to henry um i'm now going to pass you all back to phil Steele. thank you Thank you both. That was an absolutely fascinating discussion. Um, it was. It, it was. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry that we had to end. It, actually, I could have listened to more of it, but it, it, it is time to bring it to a close. Um, I would say, like, say a huge thank you to Henry and David for giving their time today um, to talk backwards, backwards, forwards, uh, and even beyond in time, and even even beyond the planet itself. Um, please do. Complete the feedback form when when you've when you've completed tonight's um, tonight's event. We we really do want to to get your feedback. Um, it re it helps us to know what works, what what doesn't work, what you're interested in, what you're not interested in, um, and and to help us deliver the best the, the best stuff that we can do for our alumni. So so please please do. Um, you can see the QR code on the screen uh, or there's a link in the chat. Um, Obviously, we've got some links, so please do do explore Henry and David's work. Um, lots of lots of brilliant reading there as well. Um, and as I said at the beginning, obviously you can um, rewatch this um, and um, tell tell other people about it, and they can watch it as well if they didn't have chance to to watch it tonight. Um, but that's all for tonight. Thank you very much for watching. <laughs>